All right, so next up we have Arissa Baxter. She is a coordinator of women's and LGBTQ affairs and sexual assault victim advocate at Oklahoma State University. She is from Tulsa, Oklahoma and has a BA in liberal arts from Hampshire College and masters in Holocaust and genocide studies from Westchester University, where she studied systems of oppression through the lens of gender, sexuality, and race. Arissa loves working with students and hopes to leave the world a better place than it was when she arrived. Please welcome Arissa Baxter. Thank you. Hi, hello. Um, my name is Iris Baxter, as mentioned. Um, I actually, you can tell I'm coming to this from higher ed because I, of course, came with like a PowerPoint, very like structured space. So um, a little bit different, but I am going to switch over to sharing my screen instead of me talking. But before I did, I just want to say hello. So everyone has a, a face to put to the name and then I'm going to get share screen going. Okay, so that should have worked. If it didn't, let me see, maybe I can't see the messages, but um, if it didn't, let us know. Okay, so um, I actually came a bit today, like I said, a bit more structured with like a, a thesis of what I wanted to talk about that isn't necessarily specifically about my background. So before I go into that, I do want to share where I'm coming from and how, why I'm here today, who brought me here, sort of what is my, my experience um, or my areas of expertise. So as mentioned, um, my main areas, I work at OSU, so Oklahoma State University, as the coordinator of women's and LGBTQ affairs, as well as a sexual assault victim advocate. So that is the bulk of my experience doing this work other than grad school and undergrad. Um, I work to, oh, let's see, there we go. I work to advise our LGBTQ and feminist centered student organizations. I provide resources and advocate, oh, nope. Okay, I'm just gonna close out of that for now. Um, I provide resources and advocacy to our um, women and LGBTQ faculty, staff, and students. That is a bulk of my job, working one-on-one -on -one with mostly LGBTQ students and faculty and staff who are wanting to navigate being LGBTQ in higher ed um, or want some assistance with that. I also, um, there it goes. So uh, work with programming, so doing our Pride Month, our LGBTQ History Month in the fall, things like that. Um, but the bulk of the reason I'm here today is really based on my, my past in training. So I run the um, LGBTQ Safe Zone training for OSU. So what that means is it's basically our like ally program. So it is a, a two and a half hour day training that you sit through with me to learn how to be a better ally to this community. So I run that through the university as well as doing diversity and inclusion workshops with our incoming and first year students. That is one of the most interesting parts of my job, but it can also be one of the most difficult because you never know what sort of preconceived notions people bring in when you're having a conversation about such a sensitive topic like diversity and anything that has to do with identity, really. So that is a huge part of my position as well. And then like I mentioned, I run um, a sexual assault victim hotline and do victim advocacy for people who have been victims of sexual violence of different kinds. So all of that to say, my background really is working with issues of systemic oppression, specifically around LGBTQ and gender and sexuality, but a lot of it, especially in grad school, I also focused on race. And I do a lot of diversity workshops and different kinds of trainings where I'm always trying to navigate having these conversations with different types of people and different audiences when these conversations can be so fraught, so emotionally fraught. So when Erica approached me about talking today, she, she mentioned something that would be interesting is hearing more about social justice and intersectionality specifically. Um, and when I was kind of toying around with what I wanted to talk about, I kind of fell on, I feel it's impossible to have a conversation without talking about Black Lives Matter, because that is where 
our social space is right now. That's where we are in our history. That is such a significant moment that we are currently in. And I think it's important that we work with what's happening, right? The movement that's already occurring, let's get on board with it and let's also make it better. So with that, I want to talk about oh, um, how we can continue to keep this sort of fight for racial justice and this push for intersectionality going beyond just this moment in time, beyond just what's happening right now. So lots of people we always hear about are finally starting to say Black Lives Matter, right? We are hearing that a ton right now in our nation. We had Nickelodeon went off air for eight minutes and 46 seconds. They actually also put up the, the children's of, I think it's the Bill of Human Rights or something like that for children as well. We have Black Lives Matter was written on the plaza leading up to the White House. Um, and then a, the sign for that name of that street was changed to, to Black Lives Matter Plaza. We have so many people that are pledging money towards this, especially corporations. Um, anyone you talk to will have heard about or read some sort of statement that some big corporation put out supporting Black Lives Matter. There's you, anything from YouTube, Amazon, any type of company like that, they're sending out these statements saying, we support Black Lives Matter, or we are donating such and such amount of money to Black Lives Matter. Um, and then there's also a couple different kinds of statements, including The, the Bachelor um, decided to announce their new Black Bachelor. This next one is going to be Black. That is the first time in the history of The Bachelor they've ever had a Black Bachelor. The show's been on for, I think, close to 15, 20 years, and it has always been a white man, but suddenly this has sort of happened in the middle of this crucial moment in our history, suddenly we have now a, um, a Black Bachelor. So a lot of these statements are going around. It's kind of impossible to ignore. Everyone is responding to our current event, in his, our current moment in history. Um, but I think we need to make sure that our efforts um, towards anti-racism don't stop with this statement, right? So, just making a statement like those that I just outlined, that's not racial justice. That's not, that's not true justice. Um, I've been rereading lately, So You Want to Talk About Race, um, which is an absolutely wonderful book that really, really builds a strong foundation for this conversation. But in that, she says, um, you know, that we can get anyone, everybody to agree with race, with everybody to say that they love people of color. We can get everyone to put out those statements. But if we don't change the system that exists, we're still not helping benefit everyone's lives. This isn't just about making a statement that you could have also made two or three months ago, but this is about changing a system that has led to the place that we are currently in, where people feel this sort of obligation to make a statement like Black Lives Matter or start becoming more vocal about fighting racism. So I, I say that we must ensure that our work, regardless of the field that we are currently in, addresses how race impacts our community. This does, if you are working in education like me, if you are working in healthcare, mental health care, whatever sort of field you are in, you have to make sure that you are thinking about things in terms of the racial justice. So again, I, I like a good quote. Um, you'll notice that throughout this, <laughs> um, race was designed to be interwoven into our social, political, and economic systems. Instead of trying to isolate or ignore race, we need to look at race as a piece of the machine. I, I strongly feel that it really doesn't matter what field you're in. You could be in electrical engineering, a, a actual physical work that you feel has very little to do with race, but race is still a factor of your day-to-day -day life and it's still a factor of your work environment. And so I really want to, as I see all these statements coming in, sort of make that as a reminder for all of us is to and continue to have those conversations. And with that, I really want to go back to the word intersectional. 
I kind of love that I'm kind of later in our presentations today because I'm pretty sure every single person has said the word intersectional. So it's kind of like we are we are pulling back to the subject that we were already in. Um, so intersectionality is a word that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw to describe specifically Black women's experiences. However, and I realized that, yep, I moved this. So this has been since expanded to describe the experience of multiple marginalized identities. So what that means is we can't just separate one part of our identity, for example, our race, from everything else. And that's the same throughout our systems. So be just because I work predominantly in sexual orientation and gender related work doesn't mean that race and disability and nationality and all of these other factors aren't important and aren't necessary to talk to, talk about, and to include in conversations in my work. So just as none of us are one person or one of these identities, we are all, all of them. We must make sure we're making those inclusions in our work. I also realized there was a chat. Oh, okay, it's just a hello. Okay, um, and then I have this in the wrong order. So I wanna go back to that. Yes, so this quote. So here's a quote from um, Kimberly Crenshaw. Again, got all of them quotes. Um, Intersectionality is a lens through which we can see our power, where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. It's not simply that there's a race problem here, a gender problem here, and a class or LGBTQ problem here. We are all representative of multiple identities and our work and how power works in our society also relates to multiple marginalized identities. So, Referring back to the work that I do, um, which is primarily focusing on LGBTQ environments in higher education, um, I wanted to give an example of how this functions in that environment. So if you are anti-LGBTQ, um, or if you are LGBTQ and you are a Native American, American Indian, or Alaskan Native, you're more likely to um, experience anti-LGBTQ victimization and discrimination. White students are less likely than any other racial or ethnic group to feel unsafe or experience that victimization because of their race or ethnicity. Black and African American students were more likely than Hispanic Latinx, white, Asian slash South Asian slash Pacific Islander students to experience out of school suspension or expulsion. So it works in every environment we're in. It's not just about, we have to support, like many people have emphasized, LGBTQ people in every space. LGBTQ students of color have to be supported in their fight for racial justice, just as much as we are supporting our other white LGBTQ students. So I, I I recommend we start to make our work intersectional by asking those uncomfortable questions that pull out and piece together how our different identities and privileges function in our spaces. So thinking about your work, um, whose voices are at the table in our organizations? The organizations that we're part of. Jose made a great point about talking about this. How many women are sitting on your board, right? How many people that are marginalized, how many people of color are sitting in these spaces? We have to ask ourselves these questions about our organizations. Who earns more than others and why? Um, I have been, I don't know if anyone else has pay, been paying attention to what's been going on with Bon Appetit, but they had a higher up in the company, which is a cooking company, come out with, um, it turns out he had done brown face and the employee, one employee of color in response started talking about how she was not earning as much as the white employees for her appearances in YouTube videos for the company. And so, as that information came out and became, you know, something people were talking about and being read, white coworkers of hers started coming forward and sharing their salaries, how much they earn, when they got raises throughout their career at that company, et cetera. 
more companies have started to do this. Um, I've seen members of media, the media organization Polygon, which is a video game organization because I like video games. <laughs> um, I saw them talking about this and sharing their salaries and comparing the salaries of the white employees to the people of color. Those kinds of conversations, despite being super uncomfortable because we're talking about something we are not necessarily used to talking about, salaries and privilege, can benefit us all because it shows where those inequities are. It shows where we need to improve. So thinking about these uncomfortable questions, who benefits from our programs? Who do we see that are benefiting from the services that we offer? If I am only seeing white students come to my office, then there's a problem. Who is not being served? Whose voice am I not reaching? Who, am, who is not hearing me and why am I not hearing from them? And that also includes asking those uncomfortable questions about ourselves. So what ways are our lives easier maybe because of some parts of our identity? And also what ways is it more difficult? These are, as I've said, uncomfortable questions. It's hard to put ourselves in a position where we feel like we're saying we have not earned things in our lives. But putting ourselves in that place can also be really powerful because as I learned that as a white woman, sometimes people may listen to me more than they may listen to someone of a person of color, then I can use that privilege to my advantage. I can say, I, yes, you're right, I am a white person. And though I have no stake in this fight for racial justice, I still think it's valuable and I'm gonna use my privilege to talk to you and get your attention to this important issue. So we can use our privileges to our advantage to help others, to spread education and awareness about issues. So there are absolutely ways that privileges can be uncomfortable, but trying to find those positives and ways that you can make it into a positive can be really helpful. And then, one last thing that I think is really important to keep in mind with intersectionality is that we have to treat racism as a systemic issue. It's not a personal issue. Talking about um, a system or a group of people being racist is not talking about one person, it's talking about systemic problems. And what I mean by that is that, well, let me, I'll come back to that. No, let me pop over. Yeah, so we always need to connect racism back to the system. So instead of saying something like, and again, these are examples that um, from So You Want to Talk About Race, which I, I recommend to everybody. Um, instead of saying something like, this teacher shouted a racial slur at a Hispanic kid and should be fired, we should, instead of focusing on the one incident and the one personal issue, link it back to the system that it is supporting. So this behavior is linked to the increased suspension, expulsion, and detention of Hispanic youth in our schools and sets an example of behavior for the children witnessing this teacher's racism that will influence the way these children are treated by their peers and how they are treated as adults. So commenting on these issues is important and making sure our voices are part of those conversations and part of that education is important but we if we talk about it in a way that connects back to the system we can understand and make the changes much more easily because firing one per, one teacher who used a racial slur doesn't necessarily mean that the next teacher two three towns over is not going to use a racial slur. But if we change the system, if we make it more unacceptable and inappropriate for that behavior to be allowed, if we show, if we dig into the roots of this issue, we can make that change. So, um, I, as I talked about, it's hard to be intersectional because it requires us to engage with our privileges but engaging with how our race, our socioeconomic status, our gender, our sexuality, our ability, et cetera, affects our life can be powerful in that it can create change. Acknowledging our privilege can really help 
improve our future. So while it is very cliche to hear the statement, check your privilege or white privilege, um, I can't tell you how many times I've had students really just wanna shut down as soon as they hear those words. If we approach it from the angle of societal change and the necessary social justice that needs to happen, we can make more change. So, I this is kind of the last bit that I wanted to share, um, and then I'll be open for questions. Um, one, this little image, I have been sharing this everywhere I see it. I really like it. I like the idea that we need to keep up momentum as we see positive changes in our society. We need to not be exhausted and give up, but keep it going, keep that, that fight for justice going. Um, and then I wanted to also share a, a quote as I fully realize that I am a white person talking a lot about racial justice. And so I want to focus on the voices of those who are actually impacted. Um, so this is a quote from an article that just came out this last week. Um, it was an opinion piece. Um, we need to, we need the people who have benefited from these systems, white people, to show up for us now and maintain this newfound commitment to anti-racism, racism, even when the hashtags fade and the spotlight turns away. Because no matter how exhausted you are by this cause, black people are more exhausted. So that is what I had sort of set up fancy to share with everyone. Um, if people have questions about anything in that presentation or about the work that I do, um, I am open to them. How, there's a question from Erica. How does OSU support LGBTQ students specifically? Yeah, so um, we have a lot of different programs. I mean, that's it's a big question. So there's a lot of different ways um, we have. So I have a program, we go into high schools and we have a leadership program for high school LGBTQ students that are considering college. Um, we have a lot of scholarships and different items like that. We have support groups um, that we run both virtually and in person. So we actually have a, a virtual one starting up next week um, for students right now. So in, in lots of different ways. I mean, it is, it, there's a lot of different ways that we can provide that support. Um, we, have pro, we have student organizations that we also run like orientation programs at the start of the year to help make sure everyone's got that community um, available to them. So, yeah. How do you explain anti-racism? How do you practice being an anti-racist? Yeah, so um, anti-racism, I think, and let me grab his name. I think it's Abraham Kendi, I believe is his name off the top of my head. Um, so he actually, he actually came to campus. We brought him to campus to speak oh, a couple of years ago, year or two ago, I'm not entirely sure, um, about his book, how, um, about anti-racism. And let me grab the name of it off because I do not know off the top of my head um, the name of the book, but he, so how to be anti-racist, how to be an anti-racist. And so what I kind of, so he came and spoke on campus and I went to that and that's kind of the first time I started shifting from just saying um, not racist to anti-racist is because of the way he um, defined it. So I give complete credit for that idea to him. It's not, it's not my invention in any way, but I define it as moving from passivity to action. So I can decide to be not racist, meaning I don't say anything racist and, and call it a day and say I'm not racist because I'm not saying anything racist. But being anti-racist is more of a commitment to continued action, continued support, and really advocacy. Action is key, I think, in saying anti-racist versus racist. If you're saying anti, you're saying you are working against a particular idea. Saying you're not that idea isn't, isn't professing any sort of statement. So by saying anti-racist, I try to move from, move to a place of action. I'm not, I'm not here to just, you know, put up a, a Black Lives Matter sticker and call it a day. Like what else can I do and how else can we support that community? So um, that's, that's really where 
how I see that definition. But I definitely recommend his book and I'll put, let me put his name in the chat. Okay, um, from Erica, um, touching back on what Jose had said about programs and organizations that may not have a lot of DEI, what do you say to those organizations who say, we want more diversity, but we don't know how to do that? What's your response to that? I think it goes from the, from the ground up. It is, you have to look at what your organization is, how you represent yourself, how you fight for others, how you speak about these issues. Because if there aren't, if there aren't diverse, if you don't have diversity, like I kind of mentioned with students, if I don't have students of color in coming to me for support, then there's a problem. There's some way that I'm not communicating my support to them so they do not feel able to come to me because I advise a black student organization so I need to know that they have no I support them so I think it really starts from the bottom up it's not just about saying we want um, diverse people we want diversity in our program it's how you send that message how you show your commitment um, I mean, Legos donated, I think, $4 million to Black Lives Matter. And while I don't think just pro giving money is, is enough, I think you have to do more than money, that's a huge commitment. That's a lot of money. And that's a statement in and of itself. So you have to look at those statements. Where's your money? How, what are you saying? Thank you. Yeah. If there's any more questions over here I'm looking. I'm not seeing any more. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Put them in the comment box. If not, um, could you put your email address in the contact? Yeah. Um, in the group chat um, in case somebody wants to contact you for further questions. Okay. Absolutely. Do we have anything else to add, Arissa? Thank you so much for sharing with us. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. I just if I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us and giving us this vital information during these times. So I really appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you.